John 17. This prayer, I've been, I've been just studying over it, of course, as we're getting ready to uh, prepare ourselves and our hearts for Resurrection Sunday or Easter, whichever you would prefer to call it. I tend to lean toward Resurrection Sunday. Um, but as we prepare our hearts for it, we've been, I've been studying just a little bit of, of some of the, the stations and the journey to the cross that Christ went through in his faithful journey to die on the cross and to forgive our sins as we place our faith in him to redeem us, to restore us. And John 17 is an amazing prayer. I like to actually call it the real Lord's Prayer. Because in, when he was, the Lord's Prayer that we've labeled it as, he was teaching his disciples how to pray. He was teaching us how to pray. But here in John 17, we get a glimpse into Jesus' prayer life. We know that many times he snuck away early in the morning, that often his disciples would get up and wonder where he was, wonder where he had gone off to, and he had snuck away to get some time with the Father. Jesus understood the importance of prayer, the power of prayer, the strength that came from prayer. A great mentor told me one time, he said, you know, you can tell a lot about a man or a woman by listening to the way they pray. And here we have the incredible opportunity, the incredible privilege to pour over one of the most intimate times with Jesus and the Father. There aren't very many other glimpses into Jesus' time when he was praying unto God, but here we've been blessed to kind of have a lengthy description of what he was praying on the eve of his uh, betrayal and his eventual destiny, which was the cross. Some of the other Gospels kind of glaze over it a little bit. We know that he took three of the disciples with him into the garden, and those three had a difficult time staying awake. And that's an important, don't miss the importance of Jesus being alone in the garden on that moment because it, he paves the way for us that when we feel alone, when we've been isolated in some of the most distressing times of our lives, that we can reflect back and understand that Jesus himself went through the same thing. That Jesus was abandoned in his moment of weakness by his disciples, and it was just him and the Father. You ever feel like that? When you're walking through something difficult, and it's like, you know what? All I've got is God right now. Everybody else has left me. Everybody else has turned their back on me. Well, I have good news for you. If the Father is enough for Jesus, then just the Father is enough for you. That you don't have to be dependent on a big fanfare and parade following you around, being in your corner and rooting you on. Now, that's a lot of fun, and I personally love it because I'm a words of affirmation guy, so the more wonderful you tell me that I am, the more that I glow. But if those people aren't around to tell you that you're wonderful in the midst of difficulty, are you able to stand? As the Apostle Paul said, having to do all that you have done, stand therefore, that we don't give up, that we find a special place with our relationship with the Father. And so we are able to get a glimpse into Jesus' prayer on one of his most vulnerable moments. Let's begin reading in John 17, verse 1. And I'm probably going to stop periodically. We're not going to read every aspect of this, but I'm going to just stop and exhort a little bit in some of the areas that I find that God has brought my attention to today. Remember, again, that Jesus had just finished instituting the Lord's Supper with his disciples. He was being led out into the garden to pray. We have this path going on, and then actually after this chapter is, is done, Jesus makes us a quick trip of, across the Kidron Valley with his disciples. He enters into the olive press, and Judas the betrayer comes to betray him. And so this is, as Jesus knows, his final moments to prepare for what is the most excruciating sacrifice ever known to mankind. And in this moment of intimacy, in this moment of Going into this trial and tribulation, we see that Jesus opens up very demonstrably in 17.1. It says, after saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven. Isn't it interesting that first thing that Jesus did is he lifted his eyes to heaven. In the midst of trial, in the midst of tribulation, what did Jesus do? He shifted his focus from earthly circumstances and put his eyes upon the Father. Put his eyes upon the throne room of grace. This is a reminder to us the importance, as Colossians 3, 1 through 2 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. See, Jesus, first and foremost, directed his attention to the throne of God where grace and power and strength and authority flow. 
He directed his attention to the throne of God to remind him of the glory that will be given to him as he endures the cross. He gets his mind right first and foremost. And isn't that the great thing about prayer is it gets your mind right. It allows you to escape for the moment the pressure of the situation and to begin to remember that there's a greater work that's taking place. What does James says? He says, count it all joy, my brethren, when you enter into various trials and tribulations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. He says, embrace them because God can work through them. Jesus, facing one of the most difficult tribulations and trials known to man, first and foremost put his eyes up to heaven, reminded himself of the bigger picture that he was sent here to glorify the Father. He directed his attention to the throne of God to remind him of the glory that would be given to him as he endured the cross. We are told this in Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, where it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Don't you know that's what Jesus was doing? getting into the presence of God so that the weight of the cross might be taken from him for a moment. And the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking, again, turning our eyes, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame And he has now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Again, as he lifted his eyes up to heaven, it reminded him of the fact that there was a joy that would come after the suffering. I have word for you this morning. Joy will come. Amen. Let's read on. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. Notice that he counted the suffering of the cross as a part of the process of being glorified. Again, many of us run from trials and tribulations because they're uncomfortable, but it could be, just could be that God is working something greater within your heart. That he is, you are in a process of being glorified. As the word says, from glory to glory, we are changed into his image. I've told you this before, everybody wants to quote the glory and the glory, but they forget about that little word too. You may be in glory today, but trust me, your two is on its way. Nobody wants to be in the two. We all want to stay in glory and in glory. Can we forget the word two? No, because two gets you to the next level of glory. So we are driven to our knees in prayer as Jesus was to remind us of the process that is taking place in our hearts and in our lives. Amen. However, as he also realized that the the cross was a part of the process of being glorified, he also spoke from a place of faith knowing and believing that God would not leave him in the state of suffering, but bring him through to a place of resurrection. Let's read on. He says it right here. Uh, For, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one of you who you have given him. And this is the way to uh, have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent. Now listen. He says, I brought... Glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. He was reminding himself of the intimate relationship that existed before we were ever on this planet. That as he was one with the Father, he is speaking from a place of faith, saying, I know that the cross is going to be difficult, but as he said in Psalms, you will not leave my soul in shield that you will deliver me out of the grave, and that I will be glorified with you once again. Let me encourage you, when you come into a place of prayer in the middle of your trial and your tribulation, try to speak forth some faith every once in a while. Try to begin to speak out from the promises that God has given you. Remind yourself, you will not leave me here, Lord. I know that this is a process. I know that this is just the beginning. But you will glorify me, hallelujah, to a place of joy and freedom once again. If I'm preaching good, somebody say amen. He spoke from not only a place of understanding the trial and the tribulation, but also speaking faith into that trial and that tribulation. He knew that that was not the end. It was not his destiny. I love what he says here. He says, glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. Oh, church, if we could only get this as a body. So many times we pray to be glorified for our own benefit. Jesus' heart was to be glorified so that he could bring glory to the Father. 
Everything that we do should point back to the Father. Everything that happens in our lives, everything that we are blessed with, our children, so many new children being born into our church this week. What a miracle, an amazing thing of life. But again, it's just another opportunity to give praise unto the Father for the blessing that he has given us. That in the midst of your trial and tribulation that you look for opportunities to return glory unto the Father. I don't know about you, church, but I want to live for his glory. I want to live for something that's bigger than just myself. I want to live for his kingdom. I believe that we have a church here who is interested in living for something greater than themselves. They're not just interested in a bless me club, but rather we are filled up so we can go out and be poured out again. Jesus lived his life for others, and we are called to the same thing, to glorify God together, to push back the gates of hell, to change the culture around us, to bring glory to the Father. Glorify us, Lord, so we can glorify you. Verse 6, I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now that they know... Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you, for I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. My prayer is not for the world. Isn't that interesting? My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you. And you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Now, I am departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. Good news for you this morning. You are being protected by the name of above all names, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. You are not left here in this world, in this culture, to barely get by. No, you have been set apart by the work of the Father, protected by his name. Jesus has ensured it with his prayer on the way to the cross, that you can count on the fact that he is your high tower, he is your refuge, he is your strength. Amen. He's a very present help in time of trouble. It's so easy to turn on the news and be distracted by all the bad things that are being said, we just witnessed the horrific things that happened this weekend, 140 people's lives lost over in Yemen. I mean, it just seems like the world is coming unglued at the hinges. But guess what? You are not of this world. You are protected by the name of the Father, the name that is above every name, the one who has written the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Hallelujah. So when you begin to hear these bad reports, you just remind yourself who is protecting you, who your shield is, who your strength is in this time. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. Verse 12, during my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that none was lost except the one, hundred, the one headed for destruction, as the scriptures foretold, which he's talking about Judas. Verse 13, now I'm coming to you. And I told them many things while I was with them in this world so that they would be filled with my joy. Hope springs eternal from the words of the Lord. Joy springs eternal from the words of the Lord. If you don't have joy, get into the word. Verse 14, I have given them your word. Listen to this right here. And the world hates them. But yet we are always so surprised when the world reacts so violently against Jesus. We're always so surprised when it seems very difficult with us on this planet. The fact of the matter is, is this, this is not our home. We are passing through, commissioned to bring light into a very, very dark world that is on a pattern for destruction. We've read it in Revelation. Now, I believe that God will redeem this earth, but ultimately, this is not my place of rest. My place of rest is in His presence, being reunited with the Father as Jesus cried out, I am being reunited with you that we should live our lives with a little bit of a saying, this isn't my place. And so when I receive tribulation and trials and difficulties, when the world and those around me hate me, I got to remember it's because I'm not of this world, that I'm filled with Jesus. I had a conversation with a gentleman on the ski lift this week. It was awesome. We were talking, and he asked, he said, what, did you, what do you do? And I said, I'm a pastor. You can see his face like 
bristle. I was like, oh, no. Here we go. Obviously not a believer. Um, and he's like, you know, I just don't care for that religion stuff. And it was like the Holy Spirit just spoke up right away within me. And I said, you know, I don't like that religion stuff either. He didn't know what to do. He looked at me strange. I was like, yeah, man, I hate religion. Religion tries to control people. Religion has killed people in the name of a false god. Religion has waged wars upon wars. I hate religion. And by this time, his eyes are starting to get real big. He's like, he's like what kind of church do you pastor? That's what he asked me. I said, well, I'm a I'm pastor of a non-denominational church. I said, I hate religion too, but you know what I love? I love Jesus. I love the teachings of Jesus. And all of a sudden, you could feel the atmosphere begin to change when I brought the name of Jesus into our presence. That it wasn't about religion. It wasn't about church. It was about a Savior who died so that I could be free. See, the world will be set off by the things that we believe, and Jesus told us that they would. But when we bring the name of Jesus in, we bring the light of Christ into the world. Amen. He says, I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. So how do you not belong to the world? Just as Christ does not belong to the world. Now, this is an awesome revelation. Because let me just ask you right now, if Jesus was here, standing here today, do you think that he would be worried or concerned at all about what's happening in this world? Do you think that he would be frightened and scared, thinking, oh, gosh, we're all going to go down with the Titanic? Would you think that the power of this world would be able to overcome his power? In the same way that Jesus is not of this world, we are not of this world. In the same way that the world cannot touch him, the darkness of this world cannot touch you because you are protected by his name, set apart, a special people, a royal priesthood. Amen. Verse 15, I love this. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, although many of us saints pray that. So I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do, says the Lord. Make them holy. Some translations say sanctify them. Other ones say set them apart, but make them holy what? By your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. And first and foremost, I want to let you know, you are set apart. You are sanctified away from this world, not by your power, not by your authority, but by his authority, by his power, by his work in your life. See, many people think if you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you do everything right, then you're being sanctified. No, the truth of the matter is it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with his goodness. You cannot escape his grace. No matter where you run, if you are called by his name, you are secure in his hand. Oh, because See, the reason it's important to understand that is because then you want to live for him. Because it's no longer that you have to to be accepted. No, you are accepted because Jesus did. What did Jesus say? He said, you sanctify them by your truth, by your word, not by their power, but by your power, your authority. You sanctify them. It is your responsibility. The, I think one of the greatest prayers you can pray is say, Jesus, I'm your business. You should have never given me the gospel. Because it's on you to bring me into a place of holiness. It's on you to sanctify me. Now, we have to surrender and work with the word. Don't get me wrong. You have to live with a life that says, God, whatever you want me to do is Jesus cried out in the garden. Please let this cup pass from me. But if it can, Father, not my will. Your will be done. That we have to live in a place of surrender. But we also have to take that weight of performance off of our shoulders and be clothed in the full grace and love and the work of the cross. The power of this prayer that he prayed, he said, Father, keep them, set them apart, sanctify them by your truth, by your power, and by your word. You are set apart by God, not by yourself. Because that's a God I love to serve. What does that mean? That means that no matter how much of a little stinker I may be sometimes, His grace is sufficient. His love is always there. He is always working on my benefit. That He is 
working with my heart, bringing me into a place of repentance, bringing me into a place of sanctification with him. Thank God I'm not what I am yesterday, but I can guarantee you I'm not what I'm going to be 10 years from now. Because God is at work in my life. It has nothing to do with my ability, everything to do with his ability. It all rests upon the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17. So that we see we are set apart by God. And ultimately, we are set apart for God. Set apart by God set apart for God. Now, there's two aspects of this I want to drive home to you today. First and foremost, being set apart, set apart for God is the fact that, did you know he delights in you? He digs you, man. He thinks you're the coolest thing since sliced bread. What did he say over the Israelites, which we are now joined into the Israelite covenant? He says, you are my own special people. He has set you apart for his joy, for his delight. Just as a father looks over his newborn baby, as we have been seeing many uh, people doing this week, and there's just such great joy. There's a newness of life that never gets old for the father. He is looking at you, singing over you, in love with you. You are his joy. And his glory covers you. Set apart for God, for his delight. And in our response, set apart for God in the way we live. Sanctified. A holy people. A royal priesthood. A chosen generation is what 1 Peter says. That we would live in a way that is different than this world lives. That if we look like the world, we have to begin to ask ourselves, what's happened You know, church should be irrelevant for the world. But yet we spend all of our time as a body of Christ trying to make Jesus relevant. He doesn't need my help. For a person who is lost, for a person who is broken, for a person who is covered, as the psalm says, in the miry clay of life, relevancy doesn't make a difference. All they need is the good news of Jesus, the fact that they are loved, they are forgiven through the cross of Christ, that it's not in their ability but in the ability of Christ to bring them into a place of holiness. That we as a church, we should stand out from the world. We're not called to be chameleons. Jesus says, who takes a light and puts it underneath a bed and hides it? No, put it upon the lampstand so that the entire room will be filled with the light. We should stick out like sore thrums, church. But I know as a pastor, I'm concerned about the body of Christ that is so concerned about filling buildings that we've taken the very power out of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're afraid to move in the way of the Spirit because what if someone gets upset and never comes back again? If you're here visiting with us, I'm not trying to make you feel awkward, but I'll tell you what, we are strange people. The Apostle Paul calls himself an alien. I'm an alien just passing through on my way to my homeland. If we seem odd to you, We should, because we are filled with the light of Christ, who is not of this world. He knows no ways of this world. This world cannot hold him, never has, and never will. Just as he came busting out of the grave that day, we too have been raised unto new life. And we are a constant reminder to the darkness of this world that Jesus is alive and he reigns in truth and power. And we hold on to the fact that he is returning for us again to take us home, to take us home. Let's live now like we've already been delivered. Let's live now as if we are standing in front of the throne room of God. Let's not compromise. Let's not play church. Let's not be lukewarm. Let's be a people that will be known as someone who seeks his face, a generation that will cry out to him and say, Lord, we desperately need you. Someone who will stand against the ways of pluralism and all the other types of things of the darkness the culture is trying to throw at us. Dr. Pearl, I have to read it. Do you have that, that, that prayer? It says this, this interesting prayer was given in Kansas at the opening session of their synod. 
It seems prayer still upsets some people. When Minister Joe Wright was asked to open the new session of the, of the Kansas Senate, everyone was expecting the usual generalities. But this is what they heard. He prayed this. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. We know your word says, woe to those who call evil good, but that is exactly what we have done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and reversed our values. We have ridiculed the absolute truth of your word and called it pluralism. We have worshipped other gods and called it multiculturalism. We have endorsed perversion and called it alternative lifestyle. We have exploited the poor and called it the lottery. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We have killed our unborn and called it choice. We have shot abortionists and called it justifiable. We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building self-esteem. We have abused power and called it politics. We have embezzled public funds and called it essential expenses. We have institutionalized bribery and called it suites of office. We have coveted our neighbor's possession and called it ambition. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O God, and know our hearts today. Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Amen. Church, we are called to be set apart. We are called to live differently because the price that was paid is too great. The death of the Son of God should weigh heavily on our hearts at all times, reminding us that we are called to live for another.